Thank you very much. I'd be grateful if you could uh, keep your Bibles open at Genesis 18 or reopen them. As we begin, let's uh, ask God one more time for his, uh, his help to uh, um, hear and understand and receive what he has to say to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who, who speaks, that there is a word which we can come to hear and which speaks in a very present and urgent way to us today. We pray that as we've already asked, that you might through it comfort us, that you might guide us in walking in your ways, that you might uh, reprove and rebuke us where we need it. We pray that you would stir us to act your word out in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. During the uh, 2012 uh, presidential election in America, the, one of the talking points that came up for those who had an interest in these sorts of things uh, was the body language of the two main candidates, uh, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. And one of the things that people noticed was that um, during the three televised debates that happened, Barack Obama would emphasize his point by, by pointing with his thumb resting on top of a, uh, of a fist like this. And whatever this jet, wherever he got this gesture, people concluded that it was probably coached by his army of advisors. And the idea was that it was to, to press home a big point, but without the sort of the rudeness or aggression of really kind of pointing with your index finger. And this morning's passage is a little bit like a thumb point at us. It's never aggressive, it's never harsh with us, but it is emphatic. And it is pressing home as a matter of importance what we've already seen before in the previous few chapters. Now, so far, we've, uh, we've followed Abraham all the way from his, his call by God back in chapter 12 through some, some of his highs and lows as he's gotten to know his God and struggled with his faith and other times been rather more faithful, through his learning, through his growing, and through to chapter 17 last week where God confirms his covenant. And Abraham responds with obedient faith by circumcising his whole household. And now this passage presses home for us the nature of being in covenant with God, what it means for us to be in covenant with him, what it looks like, what it should be like. Chapters 18 and 19 actually form a, sort of two parts of one whole, really, where, and they set up a, a, a contrast between Abraham on the one hand and Lot on the other. Now, I'm not going to pull all of that out uh, this week. We can, we can have Lot next week. But one of the big points of chapter 18 in that comparison is to highlight Abraham walking faithfully before God. Back in 17 verse 1, as God confirmed his covenant, God said to Abraham, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, or walk wholeheartedly before me. And this chapter presses home those realities, the promises made by God Almighty, and the fact that his people must walk before him. As people called into covenant with God through Christ, this passage points a thumb at us. This is the God who has called us, and this is part of what it looks like to be in covenant with him and to walk before him. And the first thing we see is that we need to walk before the Lord in generous hospitality. It's the hot part of the day when we meet Abraham in verse 1 and he's quietly taking a break back at the tent, sitting in the entrance uh, in the shade but maybe getting a bit of whatever breeze there is blowing around, uh, maybe just uh, resting his eyes as you do when it's nice and warm and you're having a sit. And suddenly he looks up and there are three men standing nearby, which is what you do back in those days when there's no doorbell but you kind of want to stop somewhere. And with that, Abraham suddenly changes gear. All thoughts of sitting on the porch with a cold one are gone. And he goes from 40 winks to host with the most in a, you know, a matter of seconds. 
In verses 2 to 5, he treats his, his guests with the greatest honor. There's massive respect here for them. It would be a privilege if they stayed. Let me do this for you. Let me get that. And you notice from the second half of verse 2, everything is done at top speed. When he saw them, verse 2, Abraham hurried to meet them. And when they accept his invitation, down in verse 6, he hurries back to the tent and he fires off a series of instructions to, to Sarah. They're almost breathless, literally. It's quick, three sears of fine flour, knead it, make bread. Now that says nothing about the state of their marriage, but uh, everything about how urgent this is. And then he runs to the livestock, not bad for a man of 99 and he chooses the finest calf, and then his in-house butcher come chef hurries off to slaughter it and prepare it. Now you can imagine that actually when you unpack this, it took a little bit of a while. But for this sort of meal, you're talking fast food. And what a meal it is. You might remember those Marks and Spencers adverts from a few years ago, and you see the, uh, the meal with a black backdrop, and it's sort of shiny and glistening. And the voiceover would desc- describes it in delicious detail, and then the closing strap line is, this isn't just food, this is M&S food. And that's the idea here as you read it. Warm, crusty loaves made with carefully selected, finely ground wheat flour. Succulent, hand-reared mamre veal served with a rich, creamy yogurt dip. Little chef, this is not. And there's loads of it. Three sears is about 24 litres. I mean, imagine 12 Coke bottles full of flour. That's going to make a lot of bread. And actually, there's only three people here, and yet there's a whole calf. This is a banquet. This is not a little bite by the side of the road. Now, the point is that this is serious hospitality, which which was a big deal back then. You did hospitality on a proper scale back in those days and in that part of the world. And in the wake of God's call back in 17 verse 1 for Abraham to walk before me and be blameless, this stands as an example of Abraham walking before God in everyday life. He's ready to welcome visitors, strangers, He honors them. He's generous. And in the wider context of the story of God's dealings with him, this is part of what it means to be righteous. Part of what it means to walk before the Lord. And this continues to be true for us. In Hebrews chapter 13, the writer tells us what it means practically to, for God's people to worship him acceptably in reverence and awe. And with this passage in mind, then he says in verse 2 of that chapter, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Walk before the Lord's in generous hospitality. The point here is not that here's somebody being hospitable in the Bible. That might be a nice thing for us to to copy. The point is, here is the man of faith. He's come through a wobble. He's grown and he is walking before his covenant God. And his life is increasingly characterized by reverent worship. And this is part of that. And as worshippers also in covenant with God through Christ, the same goes for us. Hospitality is not optional. It's not just a friendly thing to do. It is an act of worship. It may even form part of the outworking of God's purposes, as it in fact does here. And this is maybe something that we need to get to grips with. I think in our society it can be very tempting to live quite private lives. We're busy, it can be hard enough to find time for your own family, let alone anyone else. And we we tend to think in very individualistic terms that our lives really shouldn't be anybody else's business in any way. And we're really only responsible to ourselves and those who are closest to us. And although in some ways we open up our lives in all sorts of strange ways in places like Facebook and what have you, it's all done on our terms and at a distance. But this calls us to real and 
personal and generous engagement with people, with strangers even. And that's true on a personal level and on a church level. You see, our responsibility to hospitality as, is as much in where you choose to sit and who you choose to sit with and who you choose to talk to and the effort that you put into sustaining that conversation as it is in who gets to come through your front door and eat your food. Now, that's, this doesn't mean that uh, only a veal banquet is uh, what counts as hospitality. A cup of coffee is fine. But the attitude of willingness and generosity does matter. Nor does it mean that we can't be wise or discerning or that our situations aren't different and varied. The Bible offers various restrictions and deals with this in all sorts of different ways. But it doesn't negate the command. Our lives are not to be closed only except to a very select group. Our church is not a club open only to people who we think we might like to be friends with. Part of walking before the Lord, part of reverent worship, is warm, generous hospitality. Well, in verses 9 through 15, the purpose of God's visit becomes clear as God reminds us of just who we're walking before, just who we're in covenant with, He calls us to walk before the Lord who can keep his promises. Now this middle section in some ways can seem a little bit pointless and a little bit repetitive. Uh, There's nothing especially new that we don't know from chapter 17. You've got the same promise uh, made to the same person although you've now got Sarah in view and it made pretty much in the same terms. But there's a point to that not the fashion in education at the moment as I understand but I remember learning my times tables by rote when I was a child Uh, we were doing them in school and when I got home and my parents discovered this they made me write them out and then they drilled me in them I recited them time and time and time and time and time again as I'm sure many of you have and you know what I still remember most of them I still use them for mental arithmetic on the odd occasion you need to do it And that's the idea here. God is drilling his people in his promises and how it's going to happen and how how this is going to come about. One times two is two, you will have descendants. Two times two is four, Sarah will have a son. Three times two is six, the Lord will make it happen. And maybe like the seven times eight or whatever it is that you uh, always get stuck on, it's these last couple that need some extra work here. So in verse 9, God says, where's your wife Sarah? Now this already drops a big hint that Abraham's visitor is no ordinary traveler. He's a stranger as far as Abraham understands at this point, and yet he knows Sarah's name. And then in verse 10, he says, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, this is the Lord's promise. And ordinary strangers certainly don't go about promising things like this. And in the tent behind a visitor, Sarah can hear. Now, we don't know what Abraham had told her or how much he told her. I mean, let's face it, uh, married couples are... Um, It's probably not the first time that a husband has forgotten to pass on a vital piece of information. And maybe he couldn't bear to tell Sarah what what God had said to him in chapter 17 after 25 years of waiting and heartbreak. Or maybe he did tell her and she just couldn't believe it. But here as she listens, she gives a sad chuckle. She's old. Menopause is a distant memory. Abraham himself is old. Between the two of them, chances of fertility are really pretty low. Now, she hasn't laughed out loud. Verse 12 says she laughed to herself. And yet this visitor knows. And he not only knows that she laughed, so it's not just that he's got really, really good hearing. He actually knows what went through her mind as she did laugh. And so the case is made that this character is somebody very special, somebody with rather unique abilities. And in verse 14, he shows his hand. Sarah was incredulous when she heard this promise. 
and the Lord is incredulous when he hears her laughter. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And now it's in the open. It is the Lord who has come to visit. And he is drilling them in his promise in just how very certain it is and how it is most certainly going to happen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? It's a question that we need to learn like times tables because it is at the very heart of what it means to be in covenant with God. So very often we, we ask it, but we put ourselves in the center of the picture. Is this, that, or whatever too hard for me? Which isn't a bad question to ask, but it is a terrible place for God's people to stop. Because it holds us back from walking wholeheartedly before God. It sets us at the center of things. And it reframes God's covenant so that everything revolves around us instead of God's. And that is a fatal mistake because it is his covenant. And it's made by him and at his initiative and in his power. Which is maybe why our God does so love an impossible situation why he loves to make promises that are too hard why he loves to work in situations that are just well beyond our resources how will this church grow when we feel so stretched how will the gospel spread in my work when people are so indifferent and I'm so rubbish about talk, at talking to them about Jesus how will I make it to the end in the Christian life when my sins feel so very heavy and I am so weak? How will this world be made new when everything seems to be so powerful and so opposed to what God says will happen? How will the gospel survive in Iraq when IS seems so powerful? How will the gospel make progress in situations where the money seems so short or the church seems so unattractive to outsiders or people are so hostile or Christians are so feeble and so scared? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now this doesn't guarantee that he will do something wonderful in any and every situation but the point is that we are never free to feel secure in ourselves in the strength of our, resolve, our own resolve against sin, in our wisdom to work through this situation or that situation, in the size of our church, in the size of our budget or monthly giving. And we are never free to settle for anything short of what God promises, regardless of how impossible it looks. We've been called by the God for whom nothing is too hard which means that we can be certain that he will do exactly what he says. And we dare not limit. We dare not laugh. We dare not lean on our own resources. We dare not forgive, forget to give thanks. We walk before him, holding his promises close, bringing our needs and doubts and weaknesses and fears to him in prayer thanking him at every opportunity because is anything too hard for the Lord no it's not not ever this is our covenant making God this is who we walk before and this is why we walk before him Well, in verses 16 through 33, the focus widens again to include Abraham as a, an active character. And as he engages with God, we get to see a little more of what it means to walk before the Lord. And we walk before him in concern for righteousness. And now this is one of those sections of the Bible that you need to read very carefully. Uh, sometimes this passage has been used to suggest that Abraham somehow, somehow sort of changes God's mind or twists his arm in some way. And we almost read it as if Abraham is a little bit like a, a police negotiator, sort of talking a furious God out of doing something terrible and rash, haggling on behalf of wicked Sodom. In fact, it can almost seem, if you read it like that, that Abraham is rather more righteous than God is. 
But is that what's going on? Well, just for starters, notice that actually it's God who initiates the conversation in verses 16 through 20. God kicks things off. And who is Abraham concerned about? He, uh, he speaks to God on behalf of any righteous people living in the city of Sodom. And we certainly should pray that God will be merciful to people facing his judgment, but I'm not sure that's the key point here. Rather, this is about learning to be like God and to think like him. In verse 16, once dinner is over, the three men get up and get ready to go, and Abraham walks with them a little way, as was polite. And then we get this amazing scene in verses 17 to 19, where we sort of, we almost get to see inside the mind of God. It's not clear whether God is thinking to himself or whether he's having a quiet word with the uh, the two companions. We find out later that they're angels. Quiet word with the two angels with him. But either way, we just get to see a little bit of what's going on inside him. But the point is not that God is in sort of two minds about what to do next. Shall I tell him? Shall I not? The idea is to show us why the conversation that follows happens in the first place. Verse 17, then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Why is God going to tell Abraham what he's about to do in Sodom? Two reasons. One, God's blessing is going to flow out to the world through Abraham. And two, connected with that, Abraham is going to teach his family and all those who follow to keep God's way by doing what is right and just. Abraham is God's chosen man. And this conversation is an invitation for Abraham to walk in God's way, to know his Lord and to be like him. And so God tells Abraham what what he's come to do, to confirm the outcry against Sodom and its wickedness. And so the conversation begins, and you get down to verse 23, and Abraham approaches God and he says, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And God says that he will spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous people if if they are there. And Abraham carefully and humbly works his way down. 45 people, 40 righteous people, 30, 10, 20, 10. Now he is not rebuking God at this point. Verse 25 should never be read as a challenge. One writer, I think, puts it, puts it a really nice, nice way. He says, Abraham is exploring He's feeling his way forward in a spirit of faith. Verse 25 is what Abraham knows about God. The judge of all the earth will do right. And it matters to him. And he's getting to grips with this truth and he's getting to know his Lord. And what's the effect of this exchange? Well, when when you get to chapter 19, you will know already that God does destroy Sodom. And the fact that Abraham goes down and down and down and down and down, and in fact the city is destroyed anyway, means that you know that there were no righteous people in it. And that what God did was absolutely right. But more than that, at least at this stage, is that it confirms that Abraham is indeed walking in the way of the Lord. You see, back in verse 19, God had said he'd chosen Abraham to walk in his way and to do what is right and just. And here, that is exactly Abraham's concern. What is right and just? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? 
Abraham is being like his gods. He's getting to know his God. He is walking in his way. He is matching his concerns. To walk before the Lord means being like him. It means being concerned about what he is concerned about. In particular, it means being concerned about what is right and just. I remember a few years ago hearing a a well-known Christian speaker describe reading the Bible as thinking God's thoughts after him, which is a profound insight. The Bible is not just information about God. It is God revealing himself to us. It is his self-expression. We may well never have an encounter with God like this. And given Abraham's place and role in God's purposes, we probably shouldn't expect to. But we do have everything we need. In fact, you might say we have more than Abraham. Because we have all the ways that God has made himself known since the time of Abraham. And we have even more than that because we have Christ, who is God's climactic revelation of himself. And in his revelation, God invites us to to come and get to know him, to explore, if you like. And as we explore, to become like him. Walking before the Lord means knowing him, exploring his character, learning to be like him, sharing his concern for what is just and right. We read and watch and listen to all sorts of things every day. And whether we're aware of it or not, they affect us. They shape the way we think. They shape what we're concerned about. They shape what we think is good and bad, what is right and just, what we laugh about, what we love, what we hate. And they are always someone else's thoughts. Whose thoughts are you thinking after them? Whose thoughts are shaping you? feels very cliched especially in a church like this to talk about reading the bible and prayer but if we are to walk before the lord it is our lifeblood we need to know him we need to share his thoughts we will never truly share his concern for justice and righteousness unless we do which might really change the way you think about reading your bible tomorrow or today Because the idea is not finally to have an encouraging thought that will get you through the next 24 hours. It is simply to get more and more and more familiar with God and the way he thinks so that we end up thinking the same way. So that almost without even realizing it, we begin to value righteousness the way he does. The thumb has been pointed. The point is being pressed for God's covenant people. I am God Almighty. Walk before me wholeheartedly. Where is he pressing you? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God who invites weak and failing people into covenant with you. You are the God who makes wonderful, very precious promises to us. We pray that you would help us to hold tight to the fact that you are God Almighty and you are most capable of doing everything you've said. And we pray that in your grace and with your help and strength that you would help us to walk wholeheartedly before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.